you do everything on purpose and I can feel your spirit stirring oh I've been praying you've been working working it all for good so fan the flame and keep it burning you're refining in the furnace oh, all the waiting will be worth it cause you're working it all for good miracle after miracle open door after open door here it comes so get ready for Cause another one is on the way Miracle after miracle Open door after open door Here it comes So get ready for another one Cause another one is on the way Another one is on the way Rushing wind and living water You're the God of signs and God of wonders And if you will, then what can stop it? Cause you're working it all for good You're working it all for good
Thanks for joining us here at Calvary Temple Online. If you have your Bibles, turn to Isaiah chapter 62. We're gonna be going there today in Isaiah chapter 62. Before we get into the word though, it's, it's what I like to call meme time. This is where I share with you some memes that I find that I, I either find funny or I can relate to in some way and I hope that you do too. Uh, you know, we're coming up on an election here in the next couple of weeks and so uh, we, we need to Make sure we get out and vote. That's something we should do. But it reminded me of this particular meme. Uh, here, uh, I think it's creative. It's very cute. Uh, Rick Astley, Astley for president. He will never give you up. Let, he will never let you down. He will never turn around and desert you. He will never make you cry. He will never say goodbye. He will never tell a lie and hurt you. I thought it was funny. You know, hopefully you know the song uh, that Rick Astley uh, sings. So... Um, anyway, speaking of, uh, of, of the elections, kind of remind me of this particular meme I found. Uh, the blue areas are where people are kung fu fighting. In case you don't remember the song, everybody was kung fu fighting. And so pretty much covers everybody there, doesn't it, on the map. Well, today we're going to talk about, we're going to begin actually a new series entitled A Blessed Life. A Blessed Life. We're talking about a blessed life. Speaking of that, I, I, I came across this meme. I'm almost a millionaire. I have all the zeros, now I just need a one. How many can relate, right? In fact, I like this one too. They say money talks, but mine just waves goodbye. Can relate to that one as well, right? And uh, this one I thought, you know, you know I like signs, and this one I thought was rather funny in, in a way, kind of interesting. Uh, this, this sign uh, at a restaurant looks like says, uh, no senior, sen senior citizen discounts, you've had twice as long to get the money. Okay. And then, uh, and then we're doing our trunk or treat here uh, this evening. And so uh, kind of reminding me of this particular meme. 
what's with the wings, the, the husband says. And she says, well, it's my Halloween costume. I've always loved the idea of fairies and the way that they can fly around so gracefully. And he whispers down to the dog as she walks away, I think she might need bigger wings. She turns around and said, did you say something? He said, nope, nope, nope. Uh, oh, funny. Anyway, look with me at Isaiah 62. Hopefully you're there by now. Let's begin at verse number one. Because I love Zion, I will not keep still. Because my heart yearns for Jerusalem, I cannot remain silent. I will not stop praying for her until her righteousness shines like the dawn and her salvation blazes like a burning torch. The nations will see your righteousness. World leaders will be blinded by your glory and you will be given a new name by the Lord's own mouth. The Lord will hold you in his hand for all to see, a splendid crown in the hand of God. Never again will you be called the forsaken city or the desolate land. Your new name will be the city of God's delight and the bride of God. For the Lord delights in you and will claim you as his bride. Your children will commit themselves to you, O Jerusalem, just as a young man commits himself to his bride. Then God will rejoice over you as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you today for this passage of scripture and all the things it teaches us about how to live a blessed life, that you have a plan and a future for us that's glorious. And so Lord, help us to open our hearts and our ears and our spirits to receive what you want to teach us today and show us in how that we can live this blessed life. We give you the praise and glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, I have always been intrigued by the idea of the Witness Protection Program. In fact, some of my family's favorite movies are actually about uh, people that are in witness protection. You know, movies like Arnold Schwarzenegger as he's protecting Vanessa Williams in the movie Eraser, or Tommy Lee Jones as he's babysitting a group of Texas University cheerleaders in the movie Man of the House, or how about even Whoopi Goldberg in a, as she's in a convent pretending to be a nun in, in witness protection in the movie Sister Act, or even the Olsen twins in the movie Our Lips Are Sealed and I could go on and on and on. You know, whenever I see a white cargo van with no windows, I kind of wonder in my mind if it's a witness protection van. I've always wondered what it would be like to be a part of it, though. I mean, think about it. A good percentage of the people who are placed in witness protection have some kind of guilty association with dangerous criminals. But because they are cooperating with authorities and they turn over state's evidence, they, they get immunity and the government arranges a new life and a new home and a new job and a new identity ultimately for them. They get a fresh start. You know, they're free from all the chains of the past and they can start life new. You know, most of the people who enter into the program are successful, actually, at building a new life for themselves. But there are some who just can't seem to escape their old life. They can't let go of old friends. They can't stay away from the old stomping ground. They can't give up old habits. And they, can't, they, they, they just keep going back again and again and again to those things and those places. Now, they have a new life. They have a new identity. But they still see themselves as connected to what they used to be. In fact, I recently read a, a tragic story about a young woman named Brenda who had witnessed some violent crimes when she was involved with a street gang. Well, she testified and she was placed in a witness protection program, but she couldn't let go of her past. She kept calling her old friends, you know, the ones that, that were with her in the gang. She even invited a few of them to come visit her at her new home, which defeats the whole purpose of the program, right? But these so-called friends talked her into going back with them for a visit. She got in the car with them and she was never seen again alive. You know, such a tragedy, but that's the hold oftentimes that the past has on people, especially in the spiritual sense. God has promised his people a new life, a, a new identity and a clean break from the past. But sometimes we have a, a hard time letting go. We have a hard time cutting ties. And so today I wanna to talk to you about cutting ties and, and making a clean break from the past. Now, the good news of the gospel is that the past does not equal the future. I mean, tomorrow does not have to look like yesterday. Now, this theme runs all throughout Scripture that God basically says over and over, I will forgive you, and I will redeem you, and I will make you new. 
Ezekiel 36, 26 says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. We serve a God who says in Revelation 21, 5, behold, I make all things new. Today we're beginning a new series entitled A Blessed Life. And we're gonna be looking at the question, how can I live a blessed life? Now let me tell you, it doesn't come from a neatly numbered spiritual living bestseller. Being blessed is a perspective. It's a mindset of joy despite the circumstances. In the pursuit of the, uh, of the knowledge and the understanding of God's grace, we are blessed. I'm talking about a fierce resolve to seek his kingdom, to seek his word, his truth, despite the temptations of you know, blessings from the world. Jesus tells us that living a blessed life isn't really a, about getting, but it's really about being. Being blessed is more than a, a gift of material prosperity. It, it's actually a state of being inextricably linked with a deeper connection to the one true God and all that he is, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Being blessed is about cutting ties from the past and standing on God's promise for the future. Being blessed is about living the dream by fulfilling God's call on your life. Being blessed is about seeing the opportunities that God has placed in your past. Being blessed is about taking a, a long look at who you are and, and what is standing in your way of doing something about who you are and what you are today. Working at doing it now. Listen, God wants to fill your life with light and healing and goodness and direction and protection and joy and abundance and, and, and every good thing imaginable. He wants you to live a blessed, blessed life. It's your birthright as a believer. Well, today we're looking at a chapter here in Isaiah that talks about cutting ties from the past and living the blessed life that God has promised to his people. Now, this is a promise that God made thousands of years ago, and it's a promise, though, that is still true today for anybody that calls upon his name. It can be true for you, too. Starting today, if you want, this can be true for you as well. Now, we read Isaiah chapter 62, verses 1 through 5 earlier, and today I want us to look at three spiritual truths that this particular passage teaches us. First of all, number one, it promises that God will change the name that the past has put on you. Now, let me ask you, do you remember how it was, you know, back when we were kids, the, the way that we would talk to each other on the playground and, very, and, and at school? You know, I, I, I might have lived in the suburbs when I was a kid, but I still remember that the kids in our neighborhood could, could be pretty mean. You know, even to those that were supposedly our friends. I mean, they made these terrible nicknames for other kids in fact, I remember my wife, Marcia, she always tells me about how that when she was in school, her maiden name was, was Marcia Viers, and the other kids would call her Martian Virus. I mean, that's the way kids are. They will make fun of your name. They'll zero in on any defect that they see, uh, and they'll just label you with it. I mean, if you have acne or too many freckles or if you're shorter than, than, than the rest of the, of the kids or taller than the rest or skinnier or chubbier than the rest, they'll come up with some sort of special name for you and they won't let you forget it. You know, the past is the same way. In fact, it's worse than any mean-spirited school kid ever thought about being. The past will put a label on you based on something that it sees in you. And, and, and it's just true enough that you will believe it for a long time. I mean, if you let it, a label from the past can hold you back from the future that God has planned for you. In fact, Matthew West wrote a song called Hello, My Name Is. And it speaks about the names that we give to ourselves or, or maybe others give to us. The song lyrics go like this. Hello, my name is regret. I'm pretty sure we have met. Every single day of your life, I'm the whisper inside that won't let you forget. Hello, my name is Defeat. I know you recognize me. Just when you think you can win, I drag you right back down again till you've lost all belief. These are the voices. These are the lies. I have believed them for the very last time. Hello, my name is a child of the one true king. I've been saved. I've been changed. I've been set free. Amazing grace is the song I sing. Hello, my name is child of the one true king. You know, that song actually takes the words right out of Isaiah's mouth right here in verse number two. He says, you will be called by a new name. 
by the, that, that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. And then in verse number four, he says, never again will you be called the forsaken city or deserted city. Uh, the Hebrew uh, as bow means forsaken or the desolate land. The Hebrew word for desolate is Shema, which means desolate. Uh, he goes on and says, your name will be the city of God's delight. In Hebrew, that's uh, Hefzibah, which means that my delight is in her. And then he goes on and said, and the bride of God, the Hebrew word Beulah, which means married, for the Lord delights in you and he will claim you as his bride. So let me ask you, what label has the past put on you? What, what label do, do you carry today? Sinner, failure, disappointment to others, lazy, unmotivated, addicted, angry, irresponsible? Listen, we have all been attached to some kind of label, and maybe we've even earned it. But today, God is saying, I want to call you by a new name. He's saying, I want to call you my delight. I want to call you my precious bride. Isaiah goes on to say, actually, in verse number 12, they, and, and the word they actually means you, okay, they will be called the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and you will be called sought after, the city no longer deserted. Listen, whatever name that you think that you've earned for yourself, I'm telling you that God has given you a new name, one that defines your potential. God changed the name of Abram to Abraham because Abraham actually means father of many. And God promised Abraham in Genesis 12, uh, I will make you into a great nation and all the people of the earth will be blessed by you. You see, his new name defined his new identity. Now, Jesus had an impulsive, waffle-headed disciple named Simon and, and Jesus actually changed his name to Peter, which means rock. You know, his new name defined his new identity. And God has given you a new name to match your new identity. You are his bride, his beloved, his son, his daughter, his friend. You are his called one, his ambassador, his representative, his delight, the apple of his eye. I'm telling you that whatever name that the past has put on you, today you can exit out. You can forget it forever because you have a new name, which leads us to the next thing that I want you to see, and that is number two, God will give you a future worthy of your name. Now, names are very important. Names carry meaning, and they, and they, they, they can direct your future. That's why parents spend an enormous amount of time in prayer over what to name their child when they're born. You know, sometimes I wonder what some parents were thinking when they named their child, I mean, celebrities are sometimes the worst. I mean, they come up with the most unusual names for their babies. You know, I remember my daughter Lindsay telling me that she uh, had a girl in, in one of her classes uh, named Ladasha, except the mom had actually spelled it L-A dash, the little dash, A, la dash a You know, I, I thought, about that, wow, that's interesting. You know, and, and family names are also something that we need to take very seriously. I'm sure that you've heard people talk about, you know, living up to their name. You know, we take pride in our name because they reflect our heritage and our reputation. I mean, our name is very important because it can determine your personality, your character. It reflects your heritage and your rep reputation and, and your legacy that you would leave. And, and it can direct your future. And the Bible makes it very clear what God has wanted for his people all along. That his desire is that we become good. You know, that we become like him. That, that we love others, that we forgive others, that we help others, that we treat others with compassion, that we strive to be just and fair and honest in all things. God wants his people to be good. Romans chapter eight, verse 29 says, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. He wants us to be just like Jesus. I mean, ultimately that's the goal. He wants us to be just like Jesus. He also said in both the Old and the New Testament, in, in 1 Peter chapter one, verse 16, you shall be holy for I am holy. God gives you a new name. He gives you his family name. And then he gives you the power to live up to it. And this is an important distinction to understand. That when God tells you that you are his beloved, 
that, that you have been made holy, that you have the potential to live a godly life. It's not just meaningless flattery. It's true through and through. He has adopted you into his family and now you can live as a child of God. God also sees your potential and, and, and it's his stated purpose to get you there. He wants you to live up to your potential. In fact, God said this about Jerusalem and it's also true about you and me. In verse number one, he says, Jerusalem, I will speak up for your good. I will never be silent till you are safe and secure, sparkling like a flame. And then in verse three, the Lord will hold you in his hand for all to see. A splendid crown in the hand of God. And in verse 12, he goes on and said, you will be called sought after. The city no longer deserted. God is saying that even if you're not quite there, this is who you can be. This is what can happen in your life. You know, one of the greatest things about life and God is that our sins are forgiven freely and completely and absolutely forgiven. Your sins have been forgiven not just once, but again and again and again and again. And, and, and if there's a single habit that you struggle with, you can be sure that every time that you fail and every time that you go to God for forgiveness, he will forgive you through the blood of Jesus Christ. It is a wonderful and amazing thing. And I'll tell you what's even more wonderful, when you ultimately get victory over that sin that's haunted you for months or, or years or even decades. I mean, there are many areas of my life that, that I'm still working on, but it's a wonderful thing to look back and see how God has given me victory in areas where before I was, I was completely powerless. God promises to lead his people ultimately to the land of never again, of never again. Look at verse eight and nine. The Lord has sworn by his right hand and by his mighty arm, never again will I give your grain as food for your enemies. And never again will foreigners drink the new wine for which you have toiled. But those who harvest it will eat it and praise the Lord. And those who gather the grapes will drink it in the courts of my sanctuary." You know, maybe for years you've felt like the enemy is devouring your crops. You know, that the harder that you try, the more that you fail. Maybe for years that you, you believed that your name is failure or that it's defeat and regret and sorrow, but God has given you a new name and he's leading you to a new land, the, the land of never again, where you'll experience through the power of God's spirit at work in you the fullness of your potential in him. Your righteousness will shine like the dawn and your salvation will be a blazing torch and you will be a crown of splendor in God's hand and you will be called the redeemed of the Lord and you will be sought after, no longer rejected, no longer despised, no longer overlooked, no longer set aside. You will be called God's favored one. You see, God's declarations over you are not just you know, patronizing compliments to cover up your inadequacies. God's declarations over you are truth and power. He says that in him, we are more than conquerors, that we don't have to go through life defeated anymore. You see, he sees your potential. It's real, it's not made up. You can, he'll, he'll lead you to the land of never again. Are you ready to go to that land? So how do you get there? Well, Isaiah actually tells us here in, in chapter 62. In verses six and seven, he says, you who call on the Lord, give yourself no rest and give him no rest till he establishes Jerusalem and makes her the praise of the earth. Now, here's what Isaiah is saying here. That's our third point, and that is don't settle for anything less than God has prom than all that God's promised you. Don't settle for anything less than all that God has promised you. And, and until you're there, don't stop expecting it. Don't stop asking for it. Don't stop thanking God for what he is about to do. Now, I'm choosing my words carefully here because I, I don't wanna give the impression that, that, that we can start bossing God around. But he has told us very clearly in his word, as plainly as he could possibly say it, don't give up on yourself or on me. Keep your request before the throne day after day, hour after hour, minute after minute. I love that phrase, give him no rest. Because it reminds me of how that when you promise your kids something, they won't let go of it till it's done, right? 
You know, sometimes when I'm in the store and I'm waiting in the checkout line, I'll watch the people around me and see what they're doing. And it can be very enlightening to see a little kid who asked for something over and over and over again until finally the mom and dad gives in and says, okay. I mean, kids can be relentless. And if it's something they want and they think that you'll give it to them, they will not stop asking until you do. And if you promise them something, they won't let you forget it and they will continue to ask until it's done. And God wants us to do the same thing. Not because he's forgetful or lazy or distracted, but because he wants us to engage with him, believing in him, trusting in him, spending time in his fellowship. You know, just spending time in relationship with him and trusting his promises that what he said he will do. And then at the right moment, he gives us what we need. It's okay to expect God to keep his word and to fulfill his promises. It's okay to remind him reverently, no, no, but remind him that you're waiting in expectation for him to do all that he said he would do. And there is nothing wrong with refusing to settle for less. You know, when somebody gets married, they have the right, they have every right to expect their spouse to remain faithful to the wedding vows. It's not an over-the-top expectation here. You know, when you live in God, you have every right to expect that God will be faithful to his vows to you. And, and he's given you permission to remind him as often as you like. You know what I've noticed? When I remind God again and again about his promises, he reminds me again and again about my potential and the steps that I need to take to get there. He reminds me that there are some blessings that I just can't quite trust you with yet because you're not quite there. You know, the more I pray about it, the, the more he speaks to me about it through his word and through the Holy Spirit uh, until I am where I need to be. God wants me to reach that potential, to reach that place I need to be, and then he lavishes his promises upon me. You know, in closing, God has promised all of us that we can cut ties to the past and we can receive a clean break from yesterday and, and, and an abundance of blessings tomorrow. So how do we get out of the past and into the future? Well, by living the present in his presence. By living the present in his presence. Isaiah said, give him no rest. We can't obey that phrase unless we are firmly planted in the presence of God. When you spend the day in God's presence, thinking about all the great things that he has in store for you, you're gonna discover that the old life, you know, that person that you used to be, really doesn't matter much anymore. And so here's what I'm hoping you'll do. I'm hoping that you will decide today to live the present in his presence, always, no matter what. I mean, even before the, you know, all the pieces of the puzzle fall into place, even while you're waiting for some of the promises to be fulfilled, live the present in his presence. Reminding yourself and, and reminding him that you're waiting in eager expectation of his faithfulness and of his abundant blessings in your life. God has incredible blessings in store for you. If you'll cut the ties to the past and look to the future by being present, in his presence. You know, today, maybe you've not begun a relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe you've never opened up your heart to him. I want you to know God loves you so much that, that, that he sent his son Jesus into this world to die on the cross of Calvary, to pay the price for your sins, for my sins, for the sins of all mankind. He's offering us a, a clean slate, a fresh start, the, that the past can be completely wiped clean and that we're given a new life, a fresh start. You know, it's a gift that's being offered. It's a free gift, but a gift has to be received. If you've never received that gift of his forgiveness, of, uh, of eternal life, of a relationship with him, he's offering it to you today. If you just ask him to come into your life, and be your, your Lord and Savior, to begin a relationship with him right here, right now. He wants a relationship with you. And so if you've never done that and you'd like to do that today, why don't you pray this prayer with me? Say, dear Jesus, thank you for dying for my sins. I receive your forgiveness and I ask you to come into my life, be my Lord and Savior. I wanna begin a relationship with you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. 
You know, if you pray that prayer, the comment section, Pastor, I pray that prayer because I want to celebrate with you and I want to pray that God will continue to cause that relationship with him to grow. You know, many of us, maybe we've we received Christ many years ago even, some of us, and, and, and yet we, we're still holding on to some of those things from the past. God's got an incredible future for you. He, he sees your potential. He wants to bless you beyond your, your wildest imaginations. But it requires that we, we cut the ties to the past and we look toward the future. How do we do that? By spending time in his presence. By spending time with him. The more time we spend with him, reminding him of the promises that he's made, getting to know him more, the more blessed we will be, the more we receive those promises over and over and over again. So we close today. Let's just ask God to help us. To, if there's any, any things in the past that we will cut those ties to those things and that we will just look to the future, a future spent in his presence, enjoying his blessings. Father, I thank you today for your, your promises in this passage, Lord. You're not only speaking to the nation of Israel here, but Lord, you're speaking to us today. And so, Lord, we want to claim those promises. Thank you for the new name that you've given to us. Thank you that, 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 that we can live a life that's worthy of that name. But, Lord, most importantly, thank you that we're not going to, that you've given us promises and we're not going to, to, to stop short of receiving all the promises that you've made for us. You know, the blessings that you want to give to us. We know that it comes when we cut ties with the past. And, Lord, that we look to the future by spending time with you and reminding you of all your promises, even God and thanking you for him. And so we give you the praise that you want us to live a, bl a blessed life, a life that's blessed by you, seeing your promises fulfilled. And we give you the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You be blessed this week, and we'll see you again next week.